Well, here we go again today, folks. This is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. And we're in the twelfth thing in the eleventh proverb. If you'll open your Bibles today, and if you hope you got a King James Version to the eleventh proverb, and we're down in verse 15. If you have a good study Bible, it probably has little headings over different parts of it. And the things I tell you and I speak to you about on Tidbits for the Word are not something that Brother Peter is so smart that he knows. I use good workbooks. I use books with good helps, good studies, good side references, good bottom references, books that relate directly to the Bible that have to do with the Bible, not something some other man says, but something another man has worked on, interpreted. He's gone to the back of the Bible. The first time something's mentioned in the Bible, if you go back to Genesis, go back to the first time it's mentioned, that's going to be the key to that word. If you're reading a word and you don't understand it, go back to the first time it's mentioned. You may end up all the way back over there uh, to Moses, or you may end up back to the Ten Commandments. But if you want to really know what God's word is saying, go back to the key of the verse. The key is the first time it's mentioned. And then you can come on through and you can study and you can get intelligent in the Word. Do you know this Bible is a mystery to those who are not saved? This preaching that I'm doing right here to you right now is foolishness to those who aren't saved. And they say, well, that's a foolish man on there. Look at him. He's old and stupid looking and everything else. Well, all that is maybe true. But the thing about it is, it's not what I look like or anything has to do with it. It's what God's given me inside for the correction of this Word. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it said this word was put forth for us for instruction, for correction, and for reproof. Well, a lot of us don't like reproof. We just don't like to be reproved. But you're going to be if you get in this word. If you're going to study this word, you're going to find out there's some things in this word that you ain't going to like. There's some things in this word that are going to say to you, hey, you're wrong in that. you got to straighten that up. So, Back over here now, the twelfth thing is how to be safe. Verse 15, it said, He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth a sure ship is sure. That means don't cosign. Do not cosign. Do not cosign. Do not cosign. Do not cosign. You say, well, that's my son. I'm cosigning for my son. Well, you can drive a wedge in your family that will never be fixed. You say, that's my daughter. Well, you can drive a wedge in the family that you'll never fix. And a son or a daughter, you say, I'm going to co-sign for my dad. My dad's in trouble. He needs a car. I'm going to co-sign for him. You do better to buy the car and pay for it and say, Dad, if you can, you make a few payments with me, and we will. And if you can't, I'll pay for it. And that way there, there's no hard feelings. But if you, you, if you go short ship, for somebody, you're just as sure as the world going to get yourself in trouble. And you say, Brother Peter, how do you know that? I've been there 20, 30 times. I've been there. I've been there more times than you can count. That's been part of my uh, drastic, uh, uh, bad part of my life that I have stood up for people and gone in the stead of them for things and, and it just got them dropped in my lap. And time and time and time again, it doesn't work out. I said, do not co-sign. Do not do that. The Bible is against it. If you want to, if you don't believe that, you go back and take this one word, shortship, right out of this book, right here in chapter 11, and chase it all the way back to Genesis, and then chase it all the way forward to Revelation, and you're going to find out that every time you co-sign for somebody, you're going to get in trouble. If you can't, the Bible said, if you can't afford to give somebody something, don't loan it to them. If you can't loan it to them and say, this is not a loan, this is a gift, if you ever get to where you can pay it back or want to, that would be fine with me. Other than that, this is a gift. Don't loan money to somebody. If you can't afford to give it to them, don't give it to them. Say, look, I don't believe the Lord would have me give it to you. He hasn't made a way for me to just come right up and give it to you. And if I loan it to you, it's going to hurt my family. By the way, if you're married, you got a wife, 
and you're uh, and you go out and you co-sign for somebody, which I've done, you're sinning against your wife. If you've got family, you've got children, you're sinning against your children. You're putting them in jeopardy for somebody you don't even know. And I'm going to tell you something. Usually, the man that you're helping, the person you're helping, is a bad steward of what they've got. They're a bad steward of what they've had, and because they are, they're in trouble, and you're not right now. So you go over there and take part in their bad stewardship, and you know what happens? You end up in the place that they're in, and now you got to go to somebody else and say, hey, I co-signed for so-and-so over here, and I got this note dropped on me, and I'm not making enough money to pay the note and everything. Can you help me out? Well, 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 well. What a web we weave when ourself we do deceive. You're going to deceive yourself if you think that you can sign for somebody and get away with it. I don't care if it's your best friend. I don't care if it's your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. I don't care who it is. Uh, the Bible's against it. Don't go, don't go for surety for another person. And, and there's a reason why they need that surety, and it's usually a problem on their part. Now, let's go up to verse 16. The thirteenth thing is a command of different classes. And it's uh, 16, 17, and 18. These very three verses are triplets. They're coupled together, and they all go together. It said, A gracious woman retaineth her honor, and a strong man retaineth riches. Uh, I, let me start right there for a second. And I'm going to say, just about every strong man I ever met, there was a gracious woman behind him. Every strong man just about I ever met, there was a gracious woman behind him. Every good preacher I ever met had a gracious wife. And every good uh, uh, deacon that I ever met had a gracious wife. Every good missionary I ever met had a gracious wife. And I have a gracious wife. That's one reason I'm where I am today. And it said, And a strong man retaineth riches. We were just talking about the man that needed somebody to co-sign for him. A strong man retaineth riches. In verse 17, it said, The merciful man doth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. We talked about that a while ago, a couple of excerpts going tidbits for the word that a wealthy man troubles his own soul. If he was to lay in bed at night and think of how he treated people that day just for a few pennies, I said to a man one time, I said, your problem, Father, is you think more of a dime than you do a person. And he said to me, that's not right, Brother Peter. He said, I think more of a penny than I do a person. And he proved it in his life. He did. And then uh, uh, the soul uh, troubled his own soul. But he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Now, he didn't trouble just his own soul. He troubled his flesh, too. Not just the soul that's going to live forever, but this man troubles his flesh, too. It said, The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. Remember the reward we're going to have, my brothers and my sisters, is going to be eternal. And righteousness tendeth to life. So he that pursueth evil pursueth his own death. Now righteousness is attending unto life. What kind of life are we talking about? We're talking about the life that is going to be not separated from God. What is death to a Christian? Death to a Christian is being uh, divided, separated from God for a few minutes or a day or two or a week or a year. Uh, what you can do is, I, I said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul, September 5th, 1972. And since then, I broke fellowship many times, but I never broke relationship. My relationship has always been good, but I broke fellowship. You can break fellowship when you break fellowship. That's a type of death. When you lay down at night, there's no peace in your life. When you go to work the next day, there's no peace in your life. It's like if you had a fight with your wife and you you determined to in your own mind, evil spirit and weak-minded person you are, to go ahead and hold that grudge for a month or two. You don't have any fellowship for a month. You're in trouble. Now, I see our time's come and gone, folks. 
This has been Brother Pete with Tidbits from the Word. Hope to see you next time, and goodbye.